just to remind ourselves of the definition of our boundedness, which is incredibly important, as I keep saying, this is it. Uh, I, I can't exactly point at your screens. Does that work? Probably not that way, which, whatever. Uh, very important. Yeah, we, we're gonna, okay. Uh, let me just get to the point. We're back. So singletons, single operators are R bounded. The R bound is the operator norm. You have monotonicity with set inclusions. R bound, smaller sets have smaller R bounds. They're more likely to be R bounded because sometimes the larger set is not R bounded, but the smaller set is, right? Uh, if we're dealing with Hilbert spaces, then it turns out R boundedness is equivalent to uniform boundedness because the R bound is the supremum of the operator norm. You have a quality here. This is simply because if you take a finite set from within that set or finite sequence, finite sequences of vectors and finite sequences of operators, and you take the Rademacher space of Y, because Y is a Hilbert space, that Rademacher space is actually L2. So a little L2 of Y. And then when you write out what that definition is, you can simply take out the norm of each of these TNs. Everything here is squared. Of course, that's bounded by the, the maximum of these TNs maximum of these norms of TNs, but that's obviously bounded by the supremum over all the elements of the set. And then you just have the L2 norm of X, which is now X valued. And because X is also a Hilbert space, this is equal to the Rademacher norm. So you have that R bound. You have one direction and we already have the other direction. So you have equality of the R bound and the uniform bound. Uh, there's an exercise in the notes that says if X has co-type two and Y has type two, then R boundedness implies uniform boundedness. Here's the proof, but you've got some inequalities instead of equalities there. So in general, um, R boundedness is actually stronger than uniform boundedness. I haven't proven that, but in general, you can say if X does not have co-type two or Y does not have type two, then there exists a set of operators T, which is uniformly bounded and not R bounded. But we're not gonna prove that. So in full generality, we've got this property of R boundedness, which is stronger than uniform boundedness. And in a sense, it's much stronger than uniform boundedness. It tends to be pretty difficult to prove that a set of operators is R bounded in general. Uniform boundedness, you just check all of the operators individually, make sure that they've got a, a uniform bound. That's sort of easy. But with R boundedness, you always have to consider all of the elements of the set with respect to all of the other ones. It's not a property you can check by just checking every operator in the set. You always need to consider finite collections and this makes it quite complicated. I should give some examples of, of sets of operators that are R bounded and how to actually prove that. There are a couple of important examples. If you take a Barnack space and let's take a Sigma finite measure space. We haven't dealt with them for a while. And let's take a P between one and infinity. One is allowed here. For all functions G that are bounded and scalar valued on the measure space, we define the multiplication operator M sub G, which is a bounded linear operator on LP valued in X. <coughs> and this just acts on a function by point-wise multiplication of the function. Uh, 
these are bounded for all L infinity G, of course, by Holder's inequality. And you can say more than that. You have for all C less than infinity, the R bound of this set of operators. So these operators are simultaneously defined on all LP. So let's just consider them as being defined on a single Bachner space LP. If you take the set of multiplication operators by functions that have L infinity norm bounded by C, so you take this uniform bound for all of the functions, that R bound is actually controlled by C up to a constant depending on P. So the way we prove it is, say proof, fix finite sequences uh, G dot, so a sequence of bounded scalar valued functions and a finite sequence of vectors in the Barnack space. So now this is a, a space of functions, a space of X valued functions. And we need to look at this Rademacher norm. Now we have by the Kahan Kinchin inequality. that this is equivalent to this thing here. Let's write it out. Uh, the the Rademacher norm of an LP norm is equivalent to the LP norm of a Rademacher norm. That's what Kahn Kinchin tells you. Kahn Kinchin and Fabini, I should say. Fabini's theorem is here as well. So now you're looking at a, a Rademacher average here where you've just got some scalar coefficients out the front. These are scalar coefficients. For every S, you have one of these averages and it's just scalar coefficients. So you can use the contraction principle. This is controlled by C. And then you have the LP norm of the Rademacher norm without coefficients controlled by C because by assumption, all of the L infinity norms of these functions, G sub N are bounded by C. And then you use Kahn Kitchen again, but backwards. And you get the Rademacher norm of the LP norm. And that's the proof. All right. So scalar multi uh, multiplication by scalar valued functions gives you an R bounded set of operators. As long as you have a uniform L infinity bound on the functions, on the multipliers. And these are pretty important, these operators. This, this example tells you something which is generally true for R bounds. If you want a set of operators to be R bounded, the set has to somehow consist of operators that are related to each other in some way. You can't take arbitrary operators that do whatever on different things. They need to be related in some way. Our boundedness gives some sort of similarity of the operators. At least that's the way I look at it. It's This is sort of a general principle, but there's no rigorous way of saying this, of course. Basically, when you want to prove an R bound, you need to use, you need to connect the operators in some way. And here, the set of operators, they are all scalar multiplication operators. They have something in common. You can exploit that. What's another example? Well, this is not really an example, but this is, I guess, what you call a lemma, but I'm gonna call it an example. If you have two sets of operators between two Barnack spaces that are both R bounded, then the union is R bounded. And the R bound of the union is less than or equal to the sum of the R bounds. This is simple to prove. It's just a triangle inequality on Rademacher spaces. You have a sequence of operators of T union S, take the ones from T, take the ones from S, split the sum into two parts, use the R bounds individually, put it back together. Easy. Yeah, that's more of a lemma than an example, but this tells you a general principle that if you want to show that a set is R bounded, and if you can decompose it into finitely many sets, each of which is R-bounded, then the set is R-bounded. 
this is a thing that's just done all the time without mention. Because sometimes, like, as I said, you need the operators to have something to do with each other. Maybe you can pit partition it into finitely many classes of things that uh, are related, then the thing will be R-bounded. Of course, a lot of the time you want to prove some sort of uniform R-bounds over a collection of sets, and then that's even harder. But yeah, if you purely want to show R-boundedness of a set, it's enough to do this finite decomposition. Maybe you sometimes need to control how many sets you have, like how big that finite is. That's a different question. Anyway, let's go back to Fourier multipliers because we've said enough about R-bounds in the abstract for the moment. Remember, we were talking about R-boundedness because it's a necessary condition for the symbol of a Fourier multiplier. It has to have R-bounded range up to measure zero. <coughs> let's introduce a class of operators that's going to be fairly important to us. For every measurable set, of every measurable subset of the reals, I'm not going to write measurable, every subset's measurable. For every measurable S, we define an operator called the Fourier projection. So we define a Fourier projection, I'll call it delta sub S, although there's different notation that's used. The Fourier projection is just the Fourier multiplier, and its symbol is the characteristic function of the set. So scalar valued symbol, of course. This can act on X valued functions for any X because it's a scalar symbol. And we have this identification of the scalars as being as sitting inside the operators on any Barnack space to itself by scalar multiplication. These are in a sense, the most basic non-trivial Fourier multipliers. You take a function and then you just throw away any of the frequent, any of the components that aren't in the set S. That's why it's called the Fourier projection, right? It's not immediately clear that these are bounded on LP. In fact, it, I, I just said it's not immediately clear. It's not clear at all that these are bounded on LP. And uh, sometimes they're not. <laughs> That's sometimes a problem. But here's a proposition. If X is a complex UMD space, P is between one and infinity, as it always is. Then for every interval contained in the real line, this is including possibly infinite intervals. They don't have to be bounded. For every interval, the Fourier projection is bounded on LP, valid in X. And not only that, but the collection of Fourier projections to intervals is R bounded. So all of these Fourier projections acting on LP over all intervals, this sets are bounded with a constant depending only on P and X. It's important that we take intervals, not arbitrary sets. They're not necessarily going to be bounded even for arbitrary sets, let alone are bounded. But at least when you consider intervals, this collection of projection operators is R-bounded. And this is quite important. And we do need that X is UMD here. That's necessary. I haven't proven that it's necessary, but it is necessary. This will be our, our proof for the day, because we haven't really done a serious proof today. Here's going to be our serious proof. Uh, we need to use modulations, and I'm not assuming a lot of Fourier analytic experience, so I need to say what modulations are. For every eta, every frequency eta in R, the modulation of a function f by eta is another function. It's given by multiplying the function by a complex exponential. This applies to scalar valued functions, vector valued functions, whatever. As long as you can multiply by complex scalars, this applies. That's what a modulation is. We're going to use the properties that are easy enough to check that when you take a Fourier multiplier and you translate its symbol by S, this corresponds to 
conjugation by modulations. Like so. And also that if you modulate the symbol, so let's not translate this, T. If you take the Fourier multiplier with a modulated symbol, this corresponds to translating the Fourier multiplier. So what happens is Fourier multipliers intertwine modulation and translation. If you've done Fourier analysis before, you know this. If you haven't, it's not too hard. We're going to use that in this proof. So recall that the Hilbert transform is a Fourier multiplier, right? We know that it's bounded on UMD space, and we also know that it's a Fourier multiplier. It's a Fourier multiplier with this symbol here. Sorry? Yep. Is it correct that there's just translation on one side and no conjugation for the second equality? I copied it from a book. <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> I mean, the yeah, it looks like there should be another translation, shouldn't it? Suggest that it should be conjugation, right? Um, Christoph, do you know this off the top of your head? Do I have to check it? You're muted. Christoph, microphone on. <laughs> hmm. Wait. I think Christoph's trying to say something, but he's muted. Is he muted for everybody else? Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying it's awfully abstract, but yeah, I would bet there's a conjugation here. Yeah, I hope I'm not missing anything. It should be. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Right. That would make sense. That would certainly make sense. Okay. Um, I don't want to do the computation live because I know I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> but... No, let's do it live. Let's, come. let's do it. We've got time. Let's see, what is this at T? This is given by this Fourier integral T Xi mod S M Xi F hat Xi. We agree on that. Almost everywhere. I'm not going to write the almost everywhere. So this modulation just puts another two pi i t xi e to one two pi i modulating by s. So this is s xi m xi f xi. Sorry for the messy Greek letters. That's a bit better. I should have d xi. And this is e two pi i T plus S Xi M Xi F Xi. And this is the translation by minus S of T M F. It's only one translation. Have I missed anything up? Because we have the, the plus S here. If we didn't have that S, that would just be the Fourier multiplier. So all we do is shift by S. So I don't think we have this translation here. I think it was right as it was. That also surprises me. Christoph, what do you think? Also, Leonard, what do you think? <laughs> well, yeah, no, let's, uh, no, yeah. So what, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it kind of makes sense in so far that when you take m to be like constant one then you still get this shift because after you mul multiply constant one with a phase it still gives you a phase you still have a phase so yeah, this in, is true. In, that, in that sense it's not surprising that it's not conjugation that makes sense because so, when you apply, yeah. when you have constant one, in this case, the translation doesn't do anything, but the two modulations cancel each other out. Whereas in this case, modulating a constant, like on the right-hand side here, like you still have something happening if it's your identity, because it's a translation map. And then on, so you have a non-trivial map on the right and a non-trivial map on the left. 
that does make sense. This is correct. The the book that I copied from was right. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. so much it trust. It looks now. weird, but I guess that's just yeah. the way it is. It looks weird, but yeah, 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 just the way it is. Here you can rightfully say that the Fourier multiplier is intertwining modulation and translation in a sense. Here it's something a little bit different. It's not quite intertwining. <laughs> story, yeah. Intertwining means you have this form of the other these one. two things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah, let's move on. This is this is correct. That's good to check. Probably, yeah, good that you've called me up on that. Sometimes I do have to do a computation live just to remind myself that I still can. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> what was the point here? The Hilbert transform. Right. Hilbert transforms a Fourier multiplier with this symbol. So if I take I times the Hilbert transform, that's a Fourier multiplier with this symbol because you have this linearity relation, of course, with the symbols. Like if you take linear combinations of the operators, it corresponds to linear operators on the symbol. The map from symbols to operators is linear, actually. This is clear enough in the definition. So IH is a Fourier multiplier with the symbol. And you can write that as that symbol you can write as the characteristic function of the right half line minus the characteristic function of the left half line. So minus infinity to zero. And these are both Fourier projections. Like that. So you can write I plus IH on two, I being the identity map. So the identity map is a Fourier projection onto R, <laughs> of course. Then you can take this linear combination of two Fourier projections, divide by two, and you get the Fourier projection on the right half line. Here's our first step. So this particular Fourier projection is a bounded linear map because X is UMD and P is between one and infinity. So the Hilbert transform is bounded. And so linear combinations of the identity map and the Hilbert transform, they're also bounded. So this is the key thing, actually. Fourier projections can be written in terms of the Hilbert transform. This is one particular Fourier projection, not all of them, but this particular Fourier projection has a nice representation. So let's move up from there more generally for A less than B. These are both in the real line. Let's look at bounded intervals. Uh, unbounded intervals have the exact same argument. In fact, it's an easier argument. So let's just look at bounded intervals. The Fourier projection onto that interval can be written as the Fourier projection from A to infinity minus the Fourier projection from B to infinity. Just by writing them out as Fourier multipliers, checking the symbols. So this Fourier multiplier, this is, this has symbol, which is the translation by A of the characteristic function on the right half interval. And the same is true for the second Fourier projection, but with B instead of A. And what we showed before was that if you translate the symbol of a Fourier multiplier, then it corresponds to modulating the, the untranslated Fourier multiplier. So this is modulation by A the Fourier projection onto the right half line, modulation by minus A. Then you have the same for the second operator, but with B, like that. And all of these are bounded linear operators, right? Because we have this fixed bounded linear operator here, Fourier projection onto the right half line. And if we follow that up by modulation on either side, that these are both bounded operators, all of these modulations. They're bound, they're multipliers by L infinity functions. So these are obviously bounded operators on LP. So this combination of bounded linear operators is a bounded linear operator. Uh, incidentally, if you just do half infinite intervals, then you have like A to infinity, you just have half of this argument. You don't have both of the terms and it's easier. I'll just, well, I won't write that down. But the thing we really cared about was the R boundedness, not the, the boundedness. So if we look at the R bound over all intervals, actually, let's just look at bounded intervals, unbounded intervals, as I said, same argument. 
we use this representation that we had above. All of these Fourier projections are just modulations of the Fourier projection to the half to the right half interval. This is over all A less than B. <coughs> now, when you have an R bound, this is an exercise on the notes. If you have an, a set consisting of differences or linear combinations like sums of operators, then this is actually, you can do a triangle inequality thing. Basically, you can say this is less than or equal to two times the R bound of just one of the terms. Like that. So you have a term with A and a term with B, but these are just dummy variables, so you can call them both A. Now, <coughs> these modulations are just L infinity multipliers, M sub G, where the functions G are in L infinity and they have L infinity norm one. So these are uniformly bounded. And there's an exercise in the notes that says when you take compositions from R bounded sets, so you have compositions of operators of the form A, B, and C, where A is in one R, R sorry, A is in one R bounded set, B is in another R bounded set, C is in another one, this will also be R bounded. So actually, this is bounded by two times the R bound of mod A over A and R squared times the R-bound of this single operator. So we have modulation, then Fourier multiplier, then another modulation. So we have the R-bounds of these three sets that appear. And by all the results we had before, this is bounded by constant depending only on P. This is bounded, well, this is the L infinity, this is the norm of this single operator because it's an R bound of a singleton. So this R bound is controlled by one and that's everything. So remember this principle that I was saying, if you want to show that a set is R bounded, you have to somehow relate all of the operators in the set. It's exactly what we did here. This set of operators here, we wrote them all as basically modulations of a single operator. And modulations preserve R boundedness and single operators are R bounded as long as the single operator is bounded. So yeah, we showed that all of the Fourier projections can actually be written in terms of a common operator. That's what they've got in common. And that common operator, this Fourier projection ultimately boils down to the Hilbert transform, which we've already shown is bounded. Somehow I thought that proof would take longer. I've run out of notes, but I have, Thursday's notes written up already. I'm just going to move directly on to them. <laughs> um, as long as there's no questions about this result. Any questions about that? All good. So we have first, what about, what, it's thrown me off here because I thought this would take a lot longer. Give me a second to just quickly remind myself, what were we going to do on Thursday? We're going to move on to the Michelin multiplier theorem. It still feels like this whole R bounded is, I don't have a very good geometric intuition. I think with this uh, uh, UMD, we had, or, or we had this convexity. Yeah, geometry. to be honest, I don't think anybody has a really good geometric intuition of what R boundedness is. R boundedness is a new concept. It was introduced in like 2001. It's, we're getting towards new material here. And there's, there are some like big structure theorems about R boundedness that are, there's this thing about Euclidean structures that I won't say anything about because I don't understand it. But there are some structure theorems here, but it's definitely not yeah, yeah. understood. So, so here this I, is I will actually give one example. It wasn't in my notes, so I have to improvise it. It should work. Uh, example. This gives a little bit of intuition. Uh, let's take a set of operators on LP. So let's take the concrete situation where the Barnack spaces are LP spaces. And let's compute what R boundedness means there, because there we can actually get a more explicit representation of what R boundedness means. When we have one of these Rademach averages,
that we need to compute in the definition of R boundedness. So the FNs are in LP. They're vectors in this Barnack space. Of course, they're functions in this case. We had this result that Rada marker averages in LP spaces correspond to square functions. So up to a constant depending on P, this is actually the sum of the function TNFN squared in LP. We can put the square function on the inside and we don't have to write it in terms of Rada marker averages. So T is R bounded if and only if for all finite sequences Fn in LP, for all finite sequences in T, you have this kind of square function estimate. And this kind of square function estimate for a collection of operators comes up quite a bit in harmonic analysis, yeah? So at least for the concrete situation of LP spaces, R boundedness has a direct interpretation in terms of square functions. So this is what you might call T is L2 bounded. <laughs> in a sense, because this act, this norm here is the norm of this sequence TF in LP valued in L2. These are more familiar in harmonic analysis. And if you have some geometric interpretation of what that condition means, <laughs> and even that's not clear, right? That's not so simple. That gives you some clues as to what our boundedness is like. Okay, it seems to be a small step forward. I'm not sure I have a good geometric intuition. Yeah. I don't have the geometric intuition and maybe that's not even the best way to think about it, geometric intuition. But gradually you get a better feeling for how you actually prove something is R bounded, some set. And probably the hardest parts of my papers have boiled down to showing something's R bounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's an important concept. Yeah, you have these big abstract schemes here where you reduce one thing, uh, one R boundedness to another R boundedness, right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't end up. <laughs> you don't. You end have up to start with something. You have some fundamental theorems like this set of yeah. operators is R bounded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you build up. Yeah. And yeah. Let me give a theorem that I'm not going to prove because I don't have the proof in front of me, but I have time to at least state the theorem. It's called Stein's inequality. And Christoph, you should at least know this from in the scalar value setting. If X is UMD and P is between one and infinity, and if F is a filtration on a probability space omega, then the set of operators Uh, the conditional expectations of Fn. These are bounded linear operators on LP. You don't need UMD for that. Conditional expectations are always bounded on LP. The set of conditional expectations is R bounded. The set of conditional expectations coming from one particular filtration. The, the set is uniformly bounded because conditional expectations, there were in the scalar valued setting, they're positive non-expansive operators. So in the vector valued setting, they're also non-expansive. But in fact, when X is UMD, these are R bounded. I won't give it the proof, but you boil it down actually to boundedness of Martingale transforms, incidentally. So the uniform boundedness is free, but the R boundedness does use the UMD property. It's open as to whether it implies the UMD property. Is, is this your CRM or? Uh... Stein's inequality, no. <laughs> no, I mean in the, in, the, in the vector value set. No, 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 um, Bogan proved it. Uh, uh, can I ask something more about this R boundedness? So, yep. so for this Clement uh, Proust uh, yep. theorem, 
some somehow somehow the, the difference between this and uh, and what you've proved about this partial uh, Fourier like this like this Fourier uh, Fourier projection things hmm. is that the symbol the symbol in the Clement Pro's theorem uh, so 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 in the second case you take you take a constant uh, uh, function in R somehow yeah. your symbol right and um, now the question is some is yeah somehow the way I understand it is that this R boundedness is somewhere in between uniform boundedness and this um, more strong uh, hypothesis of Clement uh, this this theorem whatever yeah that's just true like if you have a and, set well. The, the, interesting yeah there's something complicated happening here and, and okay have, and then, yeah you're gonna say something then maybe, yeah yeah maybe this is maybe this is something stupid i don't know but somehow if it's you something. have like a family like like if you have a family of um of symbols like this constant yeah. si constant symbols like this uh, Fourier projection case and then you have a a maximal operator like a carlesson operator yeah and can can, can you deduce our boundedness from the from the boundedness of this maximal operator Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. Actually. Because this happens, this happens for the Fourier projection. Okay, maybe in general it is a. I mean, maybe there's a trivial counterexample. I, I, I honestly don't know. That is a good question. That's definitely not stupid. There might be some results of that kind. I don't personally know any, but it could be possible. Yeah. So I, I was going to say before you made that second point, the main difference between the the Clement Plus theorem and what I was saying about Fourier projections is that this theorem here is really about operator valued symbols. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And the Fourier multipliers that I was dealing with before these Fourier projections have got scalar valued symbols. I should say, and this is an exercise in the notes, but now's a good time to at least mention it. Uh, let's get down to the bottom of the page. This is really a proposition. For any Banach space X, if you take the set of scalars bounded by C, okay, scalars doesn't have to be complex. If you take a, a bounded set of scalars and you consider it as sitting inside the bounded linear operators on X, just scalar multiplication, identification, this is R bounded always. So for sets of scalars, seen as operators, boundedness is equivalent to uniform boundedness. No, sorry, bound, uniform boundedness is equivalent to R boundedness. This is an exercise, so I won't do the proof. I think it might even be an exam question. So <laughs> I'm not doing the proof. It comes from the contraction principle, basically. It's not hard to prove. So in when you look at the clement plus theorem, back here, if you assume that the symbol is scalar valued, Clement Proust tells you that the set or well, that the range is bounded, which is something you already knew. It's really the, the content is for operator valued symbols. Then you have this thing of R boundedness, which really has no analog at all in the scalar valued world, other than this square function thing when you're looking at LP valued functions. Yeah. That wasn't your question, but I think that relates to it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I really. You, yeah, I should have mentioned actually what does Clement Plus say in the, the scalar valued setting? Nothing, basically. <laughs> yeah. Boundedness, which you already knew. Yeah, there's definitely not time to move on to the next material now, which is good. Are there any other questions? Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, hey. I was just wondering um, whether, like, so in functional analysis, one usually uses the uniform boundedness principle to solve yep. a lot of problems. So yep. is there something like of an R bounded principle or huh. like that? I don't think so, but that's a good question. I, I would be surprised if there wasn't something like that out there somewhere, but I don't know about it. So it could be that there is such a, some analog of the uniform boundedness principle for R bounds that's just not known yet. Entirely possible, um, but I don't know. There is. I'll tell you some really vague thing about this Euclidean structures thing that I don't know about. Um, one consequence of this Euclidean structures theory is that every R bounded set of operators actually corresponds to a representation of those operators on Hilbert spaces. So given a set of operators, it's R bounded if and only if there exists Hilbert spaces and maps into the Hilbert spaces such that these operators can be seen as a uniformly bounded set of operators on that Hilbert space. 
So there is actually a direct but very abstract link between R boundedness and uniform boundedness, which says that there should be an analogy with the uniform boundedness principle, but I don't know exactly what that would be. So maybe like model or his representation, you can work with the uniform bound in the principle in the Hilbert space. I would think so, yeah. but the, the problem is that given an R-bounded set of operators, I don't think there's any concrete way of really accessing that representation. You know, it exists, but I don't know how much control you have over it. It could be very weird oh. for all I know. I don't know a lot about this theory though, so I can't say much about that. But R-boundedness is like some sort of ghost of uniform boundedness <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So there, there is a very abstract way of deducing properties of R bounds from uniform bounds, but it's incredibly abstract. 